CSGO's history features some of the most scandalous and quite frankly hilarious moments across the gaming world. And this is a tribute to some of the game's most ridiculous, shocking, and intriguing past. Boostmeister. He sees them now there, straight ahead. Considered one of the biggest controversies at the time, Fnatic's infamous overpass boost is still debated to this day. Whether you think the boost was an amazing play that was engineered by the great CSGO minds at Fnatic, or whether you think the boost was completely illegal and unnecessary, you have to admit, it made for a memorable major. This is Pronax being a genius. They Down 13 to 3 after the first 16 rounds, Fnatic finally made their 3-man boost work as Olaf Meister secured two quick kills on the unsuspecting LDLC. Fnatic would continue to use and abuse the boost round after round for the rest of the game and it would eventually win them that map over LDLC. The big issue with this boost was actually that when using the boost, some textures would become invisible and that was what was against tournament rules. We realized by getting from social media that there is a texture uh, bug. So a texture transparency from that spot where you can see almost down to uh, the T-spawn and you can see what's called tunnel. And in the rules, that is not allowed. After a series of back and forth between the teams and the admins, it was eventually ruled that the entire map would be replayed. After the final decision, however, Fnatic forfeited that match, and LDLC would go on to win their first major championship. Chicken! How, how, do, how does he do this every time? Although it's impossible to know exactly when this lobby raider first appeared in the private lobbies of professional CSGO players and tournaments around the world, what we do know is the incredible amount of craze this raider generated across the CSGO community. Appearing in the private lobbies of even Valve-sponsored events such as ESL1 Katowice 2015 and ESL1 Cologne 2015, this raider gained notoriety within the community at a rapid pace. <laughs> Chicken in the lobby here. Really, really wants to play. He has a good rank as well. I, you can see that he has a level to play in this semi-final, you know? <laughs> in no time, this chicken had a booming social media following and so many fake accounts imitating him that it would become almost impossible to keep track of the real one. This lobby raider gained so much popularity so fast that he even held an AMA with almost 500 comments and over 1,600 upvotes. There are several theories about the identity of this anonymous lobby raider with the most popular being that this is a character creation of the YouTuber Fail You, especially considering his video contribution to the chicken craze. But I guess there's no real way to tell for sure. Like all things, however, this character slash meme would eventually fade into obscurity. But we'll never forget that time when no one was safe from the chicken. The friendly chicken on screen. Valve's Christmas gift to the CSGO community, the R8 update. The R8 update was at the time probably the most game-breaking update in the history of CSGO. Not only was the R8 the most powerful pistol on release, it was hands down the most powerful gun in the game. Although there were so many things wrong about the R8 on release, the damage model was hands down the most broken. The gun had an extremely high base damage of 115, which meant you could kill an enemy with one shot to the chest. What? But not only that, it came with a million bugs. Not only could you waste ammo during freeze time, you could hold both the left and right mouse buttons to get the accuracy of a channel mouse one, but the speed of a mouse two shot. Not only that, players could defuse the bomb and right click opponents at the exact same time. Needless to say, the community was outraged and tournament organizers such as ESL refused to play on the new update. With the entire wrath of the community at its doors, Valve nerfed the R8 in a blog post entitled Damage Control. The nerfs were significant enough that less and less players began using the R8 over time. And although the R8 is hardly ever used now, there was a point in time when the R8 outdid every other gun. These are the people that hold my, my fate of being unbanned. The people that made this gun. The infamous Train Bug, aka the Bird Boost. In December of 2014, Train was reintroduced to CSGO and it came with a complete facelift. This was significant because it was the first time in the game's history where a map that was already in the game would receive a complete overhaul, signaling more of that to come in the future. Building the map from the ground up, the new DE Train was stunningly beautiful but Valve included a critical mistake. It would only take a couple of hours before the community would learn of the bird boost. With all the changes that Valve had made to the map, a new addition was the spawning of pigeons every couple of rounds down by Ivy. The big issue was that these pigeons had hitboxes that players could use to jump on top of them and then exit the map with. 
The game-breaking part of this bug was that if used properly, it would allow clear vision down into the A-bomb site for the player outside of the map, giving them an extreme unfair advantage. The bird boost was not long-lived, however, as Valve quickly got rid of the bug and set up this mural in memory of this hilarious moment. Gaming Paradise. I cannot believe that managed to happen. Considered the worst tournament ever held in the history of CSGO, 2015's Gaming Paradise was anything but. To start things off, the tournament itself began with a 12 hour delay in which the tournament organizers explained the delay was due to a rogue driver who allegedly went missing with the computers needed to run the tournament. Replacement computers were eventually brought in, but they apparently were not up to par and would drop frames and net less than 100 frames per second in smokes. It gets worse, police eventually arrived at the players' hotels and confiscated their passports because as it turns out, the organizers had not paid for those hotel rooms. The passports were later returned to the players once the police were able to confirm that the rooms were in fact booked by the organizers and not the players or teams. It looked very, very bad for them at the start of this half. The story continues with the tournament organizers eventually drafting up a new contract that stated that the players would be receiving their prize money by completing their games. But to no one's surprise, G2 who acquired the Kingwin lineup that won the tournament released a statement later that year which made it clear that the team was not to receive any of the money that they were promised. A fittingly horrendous end to a terrible tournament. Congratulations to the boys. The gambling scandals. And we found this new site called CSGO Lotto. For better or worse, CSGO and his gambling market has been in an intricate love affair since skins were first released in the arms deal update back in 2013. Many would even say that weapon skins are the reason why the game is so popular. Although it can be said that the gambling scandals first began with former CSGO player and now popular streamer Mohammed Mo Assad versus CSGO Diamond. What? No! The gambling scandals actually really exploded when a YouTuber by the name of Honor the Call made a video providing evidence that popular Call of Duty YouTubers, T Martin and Pro Syndicate, had promoted and gambled on CSGO Lotto without disclosing the fact that they were owners of that website. Through this story, several other notable streamers and prominent personalities were dragged into the forefront and the community began to seriously consider the legitimacy and morality of such websites. I didn't mean to do that! Valve's response came in July when it released an announcement stating that they had no business relationships with any of the gambling websites and that it would send out notices to cease operations. Valve followed through shortly after with said letter and the letter requested the immediate cease and desist of a long list of popular gambling websites such as CSGO Lotto, CSGO Wild, CSGO Diamonds, and most notably CSGO Lounge. The gambling crackdown had some stating that this was the end of CSGO CSGO's competitive scene and viewership, but the CSGO community held strong and were able to set new viewership records during the E-League Major. Ladies and gentlemen, your major champions, Astralis. The Cloud9 Adderall scandal. I don't even care. We're all on Adderall. Like, well, I, don't, I don't even give a fuck. Like, CSGO's doping scandal exploded mid-2015 when former Cloud9 member Semphis admitted that he and the entire C9 lineup at ESL1 Katowice were on Adderall. These remarks sparked a world of controversy about the use of drugs in esports and ESL responded quickly, teaming up with the NADA to run their first anti-PED drug test for ESL1 Cologne of that year. When Cologne ended, ESL released an article detailing the immense success of the event along with news that the random PED testing held during the event came back negative, successfully putting an end to the biggest drug scandal in CSGO history. Pro player backbands and the ensuing witch hunt. Oh, wow! Kelly! Get out of here! Get out of here! Near the end of 2014, a German pro player SMN was first caught cheating through the ESEA client. Valve and ESEA then quickly worked together to help update the Valve anti cheat system, and it was able to detect and ban SMN of Team Alternate, SF of Epsilon, and most notably, Titan's very own Kali. You said you wanted Titan special. It needs something special from these guys, and that is it. Well done, LD. Kali soon after the back ban came clean, stating that he had, in fact, used the cheat for a week. Following these back bans came an extreme witch hunt. I know that a couple of my teammates are convinced that <laughs> they, they think they cheat. 
The man most affected by this witch hunt was Flesha of Fanatic, as several videos accusing the Swede of cheating became more and more popular over the internet. Flesha defended his stance stating that he had never cheated and that he will never cheat, explaining that his unique playstyle and tendency to lift his mouse a lot more than other pros as some of the explanations for the community's suspicions. Although the winch hunt would die down eventually as time passed, speculations and suspicions of pro players cheating still continue to this day. Morning, the wasting no time again. Aggression flusher. Okay. Finds maniac through the smoke, and we'll leave it at that. The infamous I buy power throw. Can they line up for him? What is he doing? Why did he hesitate? A mistake so that would change the lives of all the members involved. The I buy power match fixing scandal is probably the biggest esports scandal of all time. On August 20th of 2014, two North American teams, I buy power and netcodeguides.com, were set to face off in an online match for the fifth season of SIBO's professional league. I buy power were heavily favored in this matchup, but were blown out 4 to 16. When the match ended, there was some speculation that the match was thrown by I Buy Power, but it was quickly brushed aside as just rumors. The story then later resurfaced when veteran esports journalist Richard Lewis brought to light new evidence in January of 2015. The new evidence provided by Richard Lewis was incriminating text messages by Derek Deborn Bourne to his former girlfriend. The texts explicitly said that, quote, they really did throw that match, and I bet for them on alternate accounts, end quote. The rest is, as they say, history. As Valve put their foot down on the people involved through a blog post entitled Integrity and Fair Play in January of 2015. Although at the time the bans were indefinite, Valve, in their 2016 blog post entitled A Follow-Up on Integrity and Fair Play, confirmed that the bans would be in fact permanent. And this is just really surprising. The Hat Bans. What we got here is that actually it's because one of the players of Immortals actually yeah. wasn't wearing the, the headset. Looking at this topic as a whole, we have to trace it back to Canada's own Northern Arena where IMT's Henny was found not wearing his headphones for the first two rounds of their final map against Cloud9. This event sparked a slew of controversy around the importance of headgear regulation in competitive play. Fast forward about a month or so and Sean Gares tweets out the following tweet. Quote, there needs to be rules on hats at events without boots. You should never be able to see a player's ear. End quote. This tweet stirred up a relevant conversation about whether hats or headgear in some way reduced the effectiveness of noise cancelling headphones on the player's heads. Although no firm conclusion could be made about whether headgear was in fact obtrusive to the noise cancelling headphones or whether pro players could use that to an advantage, the fact that the topic itself was generating unnecessary controversy around fair play became an issue. The response was swift as ESL made an official rule ahead of its Pro League Finals that headgear such as beanies would not be allowed to be worn. This trend continued on to the recent E-League Major qualifiers and even the E-League Major itself and it will most likely continue on for the foreseeable future. And that's the list! Please let us know in the comments below if you felt like we might have missed anything and make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more CSGO content. Thanks for watching! If you want more great content, be sure to hit that subscribe button.